What's up tweeners, welcome back to another Tweener at Tennis video today here on the channel and we have an amazing interview for you guys. We have the head coach at SMU, Grant Chen, who was gracious enough to host us at this year's SMU Invitational that they had this past weekend and I couldn't ask for a better experience from Coach Grant. This was an unbelievable chance for us to give them a platform to show their amazing facility. It's probably one of the best I've ever seen. And just to talk to Grant, who has his hands in every in every aspect of professional tennis and college tennis and junior tennis as well. And I am so grateful that he allowed us to join his program for the weekend. It was really cool to talk to Grant about his experiences with pro tennis players and talking about how he uses his knowledge and experience to inspire the next generation with his kids and junior tennis as well. Now, if you guys aren't subscribed to the channel, make sure to hit that subscribe button and leave a like on the video. We're trying to get to 3,000 subscribers by the end of this year, and we'd love to have you guys join the Tweener at Tennis channel so that way we can grow this community and give a spotlight to more programs like this. I hope you guys enjoyed this amazing interview with Coach Grant Chen. I wish I could have gone to a school to play tennis, but I ended up playing club and I loved it. Now, so, so did I. Really? I didn't play. I didn't play college tennis. What did you? So how I, did you? I, I went start? to. I went to UCLA. Okay. Nor, normal application process. Mm -hmm. Got in. And I'm a California kid, and and really one reason why I went to UCLA was because I wanted to be in a big city. Yeah. I wanted to go to the beach. I wanted to go to a museum. I wanted to go to a U2 concert. I wanted to go to a Laker <laughs> games. Like no, really, like that was. I wanted to experience it all. I went to Dodger games on Tuesday nights. Yeah. I went to, you know, whatever. I, I went, I tried so many things in my years of college that it was, it was really special because I wanted to be in this big town. So then I, I realized my first semester at, at UCLA, I, I missed the game. Yeah. So one of my classmates was on the team mm -hmm. and ends up, he was a German player, ends up really being the number one player for UCLA for the following three years. Yeah incredible record did well and he was like oh well you know our student manager is graduating yeah this school year why don't you check it out and i approached the head coach and that was january of 2001 and i was with billy and ucla for 18 years so now i didn't do club tennis until my third year because i i, I felt it took me a couple years to kind of handle that yeah and then i and then i did club tennis yeah loved it loved it coached it before we go back to our video from SMU, first a word from our sponsor of today's video, Halo Hydration. What makes a champion? Understanding the mental components of a game, being able to get inside the head of the opponent and stay focused on your personal game plan, knowing how to work smarter, not harder. Preparation is everything when it comes to a successful match or training session. You must focus on what you can control on and off the court. Therefore, it is crucial to get your body into its peak performance state. It is something that you can control and it always starts with hydration. That's why Halo is the sponsor of today's video. Halo is the best of the best to take on the go to hydrate better and perform better. It's the lowest in sugar of all products on the market and absorbs easily into your water and tastes incredible. Halo has been helping me out on and off the court when it comes to editing or in between when I'm coaching, even when I'm on the court playing tournaments for you guys to watch. Halo has been a great addition to my daily routine. They have so many flavors. They got pink lemonade, they got peach, they got regular lemonade, mixed berry, so many different flavors that you guys can try. And if you use the link in the description below, you can get a discount for trying out Halo Hydration. Now I want to thank Halo Hydration for sponsoring today's video, and I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the video. It, yeah. So after I graduated, I coached it. Okay. And then uh, they, we, we won the national championship uh, twice, uh, 11 and 2011 and whatever, and they okay. actually just won it a couple years ago again. Yeah. Then I got here, and club tennis is actually a really important thing for me. The club president is actually downstairs. We do a lot of things in synergy. I support them with Love balls it. and court time and you know equipment and they're supposed to go to an event in houston this weekend at okay. rice and the club president just called me because he's like you know i'm not i'm not super comfortable driving in the rain i said mm. if you're not comfortable driving in the rain then don't go like yeah or wait till later tonight or wait till tomorrow morning like when when it stops raining but the idea is i love tennis on campus good i actually love that yeah. because for you too for not playing college tennis and then coaching college tennis, what was the biggest kind of right. eye-opener for you as a coach? Not just seeing what could have been, but 
what were there any different perceptions that you had no, about it? You know, I, I think coaching is really teaching and serving. Okay. I think it really is about providing an experience and opportunity and guiding whoever it is you're teaching. In mm -hmm. my situation, it's 18 to 22 year old, you know, college students, um, and it's allowing them the opportunity to, to to find out who they are, to grow. So so much of it, honestly, isn't tennis related. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are times we work on forehands and backhands and serves and technique, mm -hmm. but other times it's really tactics. Yeah. It's uh, you know tendencies, it's strength and conditioning, it's also kind of finding themselves, finding their games, understanding who they are, mm -hmm. and uh, why are they playing tennis, and how are they winning points, how are yeah. they losing matches. You know, that was one thing I was working on with one of my players earlier today. It was, it was the tennis was fine, yeah. but he was losing a match. And then, you know, obviously, I think changed his lens, his perspective, probably a little bit more positive body language, and mm -hmm. next thing you know, he wins the second set, and, you know, there you go. Now we're in the third. So for you, too, how did you get into this spectrum of college tennis because like you said you play club tennis yep. you've worked with a couple pros on tour yep. John Isner Grigor Dimitrov which we'll get to in a second what how did you officially decide you wanted to have this as your career path I think at the root of it I love this game mm -hmm. I think that's what it really boils down to is I really am passionate about this game of tennis my my freshman year at UCLA I played tennis once the entire fall Really? And, and it got to the point where I was, frankly, unhappy. I was unhappy with everything. And yeah. it, it had nothing to do with school or anything. It was just, I think I found that there was a void missing. And that void was tennis. And so I started to play. I started to get involved. I started to enter some local USTA open tournaments just to, just to play. Mm -hmm. And I remember bringing my rackets out of the closet for the first time in two and a half months. You know, and I remember it was November. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted, I started playing, I played with anybody. Yeah. You know, the, the kid down the hall, you know, another freshman, club tennis, whoever. And I just started to get back on the tennis court. And that found, I found my mojo again. And then that's when I approached the head coach at UCLA. I remember this, this was January of 2001. And I just said, hey, you know, look, I'd love to try to help out and be involved. And, and, and then really, frankly, the rest is history. I started working with the team and I just found different ways to get involved. And for me, it was about staying involved in tennis and being around tennis. And L.A. is such a great mm -hmm. tennis community. And at the time, we also had the Los Angeles Open. It was an yeah. ATP event held in July, part of the U.S. Open series leading up to New York. And that was fun for me to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. And then I got involved with camps. I got involved with, you know, tennis on campus. I got involved with so many different things in tennis. And that was really exciting for me. And so as the years went on, I just found ways to continue to essentially evolve, adapt, um, get more immersed in the sport. And I helped out and I volunteered everywhere. You know, champion series events mm -hmm. um, with uh, the legends. So Pete, Courier, Andre, yeah. uh, Chang, and Todd Martin, and all those guys. I got involved with, uh, you know, other pros. I got involved at Indian Wells. I, I started helping out at the Tennis Channel. I, I, I just found ways to get involved. And what that allowed me to do is also find a lot of things that I was interested and passionate about, mm -hmm. but also ruled out, hey, you know what? Maybe that's not exactly for me and I realized okay I didn't want to do X Y and Z okay but I was really able to focus on these things mm -hmm. so tennis was kind of the root of it all and, and it just became uh, something that I wanted to continue to be around it seems like it became a process of elimination right and for you it seems like you you still have many hats here at SMU and it's not just head coach it's not just the guy kids come to for their advice how hard was it for you to kind of pick which one you want to stay with? You know, I, I think I just surround myself with the good people, the mm -hmm. right people, and, and people that I wanted to be with. Mm -hmm. And who did I want to associate myself with? And who did I want to interact with? You know, even someone to play tennis with on a Sunday afternoon with no one around. Yeah. You know, it's not about, hey, winning a baseline game or losing a baseline game. And it was like, okay, these guys I enjoy playing tennis with or these people I want to play tennis with. And we go out there, break a sweat. You know, an hour and a half later, we walk off and, and then we go get some dinner. Yeah. But I think that was really something special that this sport has given me so much. Mm -hmm. And I think in turn also, I want to try to pay it forward. How mm -hmm. can we continue to help grow the game? How can we help, you know, the next generation of tennis players want to play this game? Yeah. You know, and, and that's frankly why, you know, this week has been spe special. The WTA Championships has been here. I've been there a couple of nights already. Mm -hmm. And it's fun to see another venue. Yeah. I, I have no official capacity. I'm not working the event. I'm yeah. not 
coaching anybody. It's just you, you kind of be able to enjoy being a spectator. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the sport is incredible. It, it, it's, it's a thing that encompasses everyone. And for tennis to be in every, almost every country in the world, yep. to have a global scale, to be not just for kids, adults, the country clubs, the parks, it's, it's very inclusive. Absolutely. While it may be an expensive sport to some, it is still inclusive to any, any demographic in the world. So for you, when you coach, to kind of stick along those lines of SMU coaching, how, what's your way of coaching? What's your philosophy? And how do you approach coaching your players out on court? Well, my personal approach, I think I come, I come at it from two different levels. I think one is, is try to be extremely positive and supporting. Mm -hmm. You know, I think most of the times in tennis, you're kind of out there on your alone, alone mm -hmm. but to be able to have someone in your corner, yeah. you know, a caddy, a, you know, a cut man in boxing, mm. kind of just uh, your own little entourage a little bit. So yeah. I try to be able to support that and uh, support our players. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I try to do. Now, there are tendencies I try to identify and help um, spot for my players, yeah. but also my coaching staff, you know, both yeah. Coach Ben and Coach Gray, we have very different skill sets and strengths that we bring to the table. So, you know, this area I'm not as uh, versed in, well, hey, Ben yeah. is, and then vice versa. Okay. Um, and, and I think from an approach and development standpoint, I think it starts, um, it's a 24 seven mindset. Okay. How we sleep, how we eat, approaching our day. Mm -hmm. You know, when do we get here for treatment and, and preparation and walking on the court? Tennis is not just the time you spend no. on court. It's, it's so much more, you know, even, you know, I think the pros, it's, it's truly a, an indicator when, when Rafa is playing a match, he, he warms up four hours before he plays. And then, so that means he's getting there you know, 90 minutes before that, and he's in the gym and doing treatment, and then you know, he eats at this point and he does that, and then after he plays, he's doing you know, all his post-match um, routine. routine. And, yeah. But next thing you know, you're, you're, you know, it's a 12-hour day. Yeah. And then you, know, you happen to win, and now tomorrow you gotta do it again. So I think it's, it's really a 24 seven mindset. Now there are wow. times that you can turn off the tennis component, yeah. but I think we have to be very aware of how we approach it and be very intentional when we step on the court. And I think that's what I try to be very diligent about is a lot of the other variables and intangibles to help us mm -hmm. put ourselves in the mind frame to play our best tennis. A hundred percent. And for you two, talking about different coaches and how they approach the game, what would you say you do differently versus your other two coaches? You were talking about different skill sets. So what are your assistants good at that help you along the lines of coaching someone on court? Well, I think we all bring different experiences to the table. How I got to here and how they got here or any coach gets to, gets to point, you know, whatever point they are at, mm -hmm. they have life experiences in their playing careers. You know, I wasn't the most proficient player. I didn't play pro tennis. I didn't play college tennis. I was a pretty good high school player at best, but I just loved the game. Mm -hmm. You know, Gray played at the highest level. He played, he was an All-American at Mississippi, and then he played on tour and doubles, and Ben too, you know, he's traveled the world with players, and you know, he's played college tennis as well. And so we all come here with such different experiences and backgrounds, but I think all of it comes together when we try to provide, you know, and help our guys be their best. You know, my approach is sometimes a, um, a rising tide raises all boats. So in a team of 15 guys, it's about elevating everybody. Yeah. It's not just focusing on this player or that player, you know, seniors or freshmen, it's about elevating everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something I really try to, to continue to remember is how we can get better as a team. Mm -hmm. And if we get better individually, it'll help our team get better. And it's funny that you mentioned that too, with the pro aspect with, it seems like all of you have some aspect or hand within the pro circuit. You, with Grigor Dimitrov, John Isner, along those guys, having someone that's been on the pro tour on your coaching staff, what would you say is something that you tell your guys that you have learned from Grigor or John? You know, I, I think that transition from juniors to college and college to pros, and, and with some juniors straight to pros, it, it's understanding that it's, it's well beyond tennis. Yeah. You know, when you get on pro tour, it's about handling finances and travel and budgets. And in many ways, you're your own CEO, yeah. CEO of your own corporation, your own company. You know, now some are fortunate enough to have contracts and agents and, uh, you know, clothing deals and racket deals. But then you're managing that, the responsibilities and, and commitments to your 
to your supporters. Um, and some of it is financially, some of it is um, you know, product-based, mm -hmm. but same thing, and, and managing your resources. Yeah. You know, you lose first round in a tournament, now you've got six days to then figure out what you're gonna do before the next tournament. Do you go to this event? Do you go to that event? Do you play a challenger? Do you play an ATP event? Are you playing futures? So there's so many different ways. There's not just one cookie cutter path in, in the sport of tennis. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what makes it both very challenging, but also very unique. Because mm -hmm. you can really take your own pathway. Mm -hmm. You know, you got guys like John and Stevie and Mackie mm -hmm. and everyone. They, they went the juniors to college, yes. was very successful at the college level, and then made that transition yeah. to the pros. And then you've got others who maybe did not play college tennis. Yeah. You know, and then how do, how do they get to where they are? Mm -hmm. You know, and then some are focusing more on doubles. Some are focusing on singles. Some have been successful in both. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's been something that is, is really interesting is that you've got to figure out your own pathway that makes sense for you. Mm -hmm. Are you playing more tournaments domestically because it's more convenient? Yeah. Or are you going to put yourself out there and travel to different continents and countries, time zones and travel? Because... You know, I think arguably the, the hardest thing about being on tour is travel. Yeah. And I think most players will tell you, you know, different beds every week, hotels. You know, do you take a train somewhere? Do you rent a car? Are you sharing a room? Are you doing yeah. this? Are you flying? Yeah. You know, are you flying? Not everyone is flying net jets. You know, no. I think, you know, many people are, are flying commercially or economy or whatever it yeah. might be that fits their budget and where they are in their tennis game. Yeah. But I think it, it, it's one of those things where they all have to understand that being the CEO and what is the, where is the ROI and what they're trying to do and mm -hmm. how they can get to, you know, where they want to get to in tennis. And for you, I actually want to talk about a little bit with Grigor. It's not every day you get to talk to someone that's that close with a top level guy. How did you and Grigor kind of work together as well as establish this relationship that you two have now? Well, I mean, I've known him for well over 10 years. One, oh, wow. of, my, one of my closest friends, um, you know, from a professional standpoint, I actually have no, you know, uh, title with him. You know, I'm okay. just, I'm really friend first. He has okay. great coaches around him. He has great physios around him. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, as a friend, I, I, I support him whether he wins or loses, whether he's in the U.S. or overseas. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's um, a, a special friendship. And he's also been extremely supportive of what I do, not mm -hmm. just from a coaching standpoint, but supportive of, you know, the team, mm -hmm. SMU and, you know, the whatever, uh, you know, is in my um, in, in my scope of work. And, and I think that's, you know, being a, a good, solid friend. Yeah. But it's been really fun to see and be a part of so many of his great matches mm -hmm. in, in, in victories and in defeats. Yeah. And I think that's the, kind of the thing because in tennis, at the end of the week, at the end of the tournament, there's only one winner. Yeah. And, I, and I think that's tough. Yeah. You know, you, 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 you take guys who have been very successful at the college level. You know, Mackey went undefeated for 16 months in college. Stevie Johnson didn't lose a singles match for mm -hmm. two years. Cam Norrie was extremely successful. Same thing with John. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you enter the pro tour and, and you're not getting as many wins. Mm -hmm. And frankly, all of a sudden you look three months have gone by and you've only played five matches. Yeah. You know, where, you know, on a given college week, they're playing three, four, five matches a week. Mm -hmm. So I think it really is a, is a, a learning curve. Yeah. I um, mean, I think it's being able to understand the tough rigors of what, what is demanded on the pro tour. Yeah. But I will say something that I think is common is the things that we're thinking about on, on, on junior level, you know, college level and the pro level is very, very similar. Yeah. And most of that is b between the ears. Yeah. You know, everyone's got great forehands and serves and moves well and do all those things. And, but it's, it's how they handle the day in, day out yeah. that I think shows with the little differences, you know, and, yeah. and you know, even the top guys this, you know, each and every se season, is their forehand that much better than somebody else's? Maybe, maybe not. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of intangibles that help them get over the edge and, and get those wins. Because sometimes, you know, you can win less points than your opponent mm -hmm. and still get a W, which yeah. is crazy to think. You know, and sometimes you look at these point margins and, you know, it's 51-49 or 50-50. So you're talking about only winning maybe two or a couple points more than your opponent, but then you have a victory. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Talk about a very, uh, a sport that gives it to you very, it'll humble you. Yeah. It'll humble you for sure. But it's an amazing sport. So for you too, I want to ask, and this might be a little bit controversial being a college tennis coach, but when you see kids now, especially ones, I think, 
Darwin Blanche is the most recent sure. one to announce as a 15 year old, 15 or 16 around those lines, to announce that he's going full time pro sure. at that young of an age. You're the first one that we really saw was Coco Golf, at least on the women's side. What's why do you think kids would want to go to college tennis or pro versus vice versa? Well, you know, look, I think first off, I would hope that they have a great support team around them, mm -hmm. you know, to also guide them and counsel them because every situation is going to be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Darwin actually just got, I believe, his first ATP point the other yeah. day, and I, I think that was uh, exciting for him. Mm -hmm. uh, but everyone's going to take their own pathway. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think we've seen so many players over the many, many years who have done different routes, and some have been successful, some, you know, maybe not, and, you know, are they cautionary tales? No, I mean, everyone just does it differently. Yeah. You know, and I think as, as the years go on, I think you realize who each person are, and but I, I think at each level you can experience and enjoy that moment. You yeah. know, and I think some people really needed college tennis or need college tennis in those years to develop and mature. You know, I mean, I know for a fact a lot of these guys needed those years in college with that team and that support and that coaching staff and really life experiences. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's it's amazing how those who did go to college on tour always have that common bond. Yeah. They talk about the NCAAs, they talk about college football and March Madness and you know who did what at the national indoors and yeah. this and that. And then you know on the, on the flip side, players who may not have taken the college route, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's, not, it's something that they may or may not connect with. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's not something that they experience and, and therefore it's not something that they um, are passionate about or maybe are less passionate about. So, um, but I think hopefully everyone has a good support team and can make the best decision that hopefully allows, that's best suited for them. For you too, especially when kids come from a bigger university or have a great support system around them, do you think it's harder for them to go pro because then they're isolated? They don't, they, of course they can come back here, they can come back to the college that they played for, or even if they didn't play for that's near them like John does here, do you think it's harder for them to go pro because they're used to having a full staff around them? I think it's an adjustment period. Yeah. I, you know, I think that's one thing for sure. I mean, whether it's Mackie or Marcos, uh, who are now on tour and have yeah. done very well, and Max Cressy, you know, I think yeah. they, they've figured out what they've needed to be successful on tour. And also, it's, it's, it's important to remember that, you know, they didn't go to top 50 in the world overnight. You know, yeah. I mean, that, that stuff takes some time. I mean... Marcos overcame, you know, double hip surgery to, to get to where he is now and, and had a really, a, I think, a wonderful breakout year and has continued to do well and has done, you know, played in the Olympics and mm. some incredible things that no one can ever take away from him. And same mm -hmm. thing with Mackey. I mean, Mackey, mm -hmm. you know, had a really, really challenging uh, injury that required surgery at the French Open that one year when he uh, yeah. you know, got hurt on the clay. And to see him rebound, but also I think it was good for him to understand what life was maybe like without tennis. Mm -hmm. So he did some commentating. He, he, he helped chip away at his UCLA degree. So he's very, very close to getting his degree. But I think it's, it's also good to put things in perspective to understand what we really do. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, COVID just hit a couple years ago. And, and for a couple of weeks, I had nothing to do. Professionally, I had nothing to do because there was no practice. There was no recruiting. I, I was you couldn't do anything. I couldn't do anything. And my wife was, you know, busier than ever because she's in the corporate world, and yeah. and she was working 18-hour days, and I was my biggest decision was what was for lunch. So, <laughs> but at the same time, it, it it gave me a chance to also reflect on what we have done as a team, yeah. what I've done personally, professionally, and then also where we want to go moving forward. So I think it, it really gave me a time to kind of reset. And for you, and. I know you have a very busy day no, right we're, now. We're but good. We're good. For, for you, when you have something like that or you have downtime, what, do, you, do you ever reflect on things that you could have done better and or is there something that you wish you would have done but you didn't in the past or a you regret? Know, you know, I think regrets always can be there, but mm -hmm. I really try to avoid the Monday morning quarterbacking. You know, it's like, listen, whatever you, whatever happened, whether it's lineups or this match or that match, you know, we move on. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, also the, the nice thing about sports is there's going to be another event. There's going to yeah. be another tournament. There's going to be another season. And I think that year in, year out fight to get to 
the national championship or whatever the goal is, yeah. is, you know, we keep on striving for it. You know, at UCLA, our, our goals and our expectations each and every season was, was pretty high. And we kept on chasing that and wanting that. And, and some years we met it, some years we didn't. Mm -hmm. And it, even in moving here, those goals were still there, but we had to adjust them accordingly. Mm -hmm. And so putting those things in perspective, but you know, one thing I enjoy is really the sport. You know, mm -hmm. my wife and I, when we go on vacation, we end up at Roland Garros or Wimbledon <laughs> or the WTA finals. You know I mean? Yeah. That's something that we've enjoyed is we, we want to spend it playing tennis or mm -hmm. watching tennis or enjoying it. And, and I think that's something that has always been a common theme and we're, we're both very active and mm -hmm. enjoy the game. And sometimes we play mixed doubles together. Sometimes we play <laughs> against each other. Um, How does that go? It, it's, <laughs> it's, um, it's better not to play together. Okay. Uh, oh, I thought it was going to be the other way around. You know, uh, although we, we did play one tournament together in mix and we happened to win the title. So there you go. And I think we're going to end it at there and leave it on a good note. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I, you know, it's a great game. And one thing I love about the sport is that, you know, not only can you play at all different ages, yeah. but also all different abilities yeah. and, you know, adaptive sports. We can play with able bodies and adaptive sports. And I think that's something that's really fun. And, uh, you know, I've been involved with a couple different organizations that are pretty big on wheelchair tennis. And I think that's just oh, yeah. something special to be able to help because this is a sport that so many can play. Yeah. Uh, you know, I picked it up because my dad started tossing me tennis balls when I was three, four, five years old at a park. And, you know, that was a young age and I yeah. just never wanted to stop hitting tennis balls. And for my last question for you, and this is more on a broad spectrum because this is a very, it's a, it's a very hard question to answer straightforward, but you kind of touched upon it in terms of putting your hand in the, like multiple cookie jars. How do you grow a sport, or at least when you have a huge event like the WTA Finals that's happening in Fort Worth as we speak, how do you promote tennis on a bigger scale so that way it's not seen as a sport in the background or it's not paid attention to unless an American wins a Grand Slam yeah. or you have someone that rises to the occasion like a Serena or a Venus did? Yeah. Because those are, to be honest, the last two greatest of Americans on the female side to play a sport to kind of redefine a generation in the United States? Well, I think it, it, to grow a sport requires everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, it requires people like Roger, Serena, Rafa to help transcend our game mm -hmm. and take it well beyond uh, the normal tennis community. But it also takes manufacturers and rackets and shoes and it also takes people and coaches and grassroots high school coaches, junior coaches. It really takes everybody to do their part to be able to give back and help grow their sport. Yeah. You know, and I think that's one thing that it, it's important to keep in mind is we can all work in unison, in harmony to grow our sport. Mm -hmm. You know, one coach and, my, and myself, we're not in competition with each other. Mm -hmm. We should all be able to collaborate and help each other. Mm -hmm. So whether it's one academy, one tennis camp, one this, one that, nah. I think we can all coexist. Mm -hmm. And I think with each other, it only helps. So, you know, I, I, whether all these activities in cities and communities, we need to all come together to grow the game. You know, I think COVID showed how, how many people actually fell in love with the game or mm -hmm. picked up the, the sport of tennis again during COVID because mm -hmm. it was so safe. You were 70, 50, you know, 70, 80 feet across the net from each other. You know, everyone had a couple of tennis balls and, you know, went to the local park and just played tennis. I mean, it was probably as safe as an activity as you possibly could from, from that standpoint, but we need to all jump on board to maximize that yeah. and give ourselves, give our community and give our players mm -hmm. more opportunities to play. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's a tournament, league tennis, you know, help build more tennis courts and also from the grassroots level. Yeah. And I, I think it's just shaping that future. And so that's one of the reasons why I really enjoy camp. Yeah. Um, I fell in love with the t sport of tennis because I attended camp when I was eight for one week in the summer, mm -hmm. and it was the, it was the most fun six days I've had. Love and it. since then, I wanted to go back. Love and it. then after I got to to college and helping out at camps, that was kind of my mission statement was to kind of really pay it forward and allow the next group of kids to be able to play the game. I love it, Grant. Thank you so much for doing oh, this. Thank really you, thank you. It. Oh my God, it's my pleasure. <laughs>